All right. <laughs> I try. I try every day not to start with that word, and I just it just comes. All right. <laughs> We're doing Trisharda Devi and her divine play. She's an incarnation of God that came at the same time that Ramakrishna came. Uh, there's an idea out there, a Hindu idea, that anytime God has incarnated, that he always incarnates as male and female, and not just one or the other. And uh, so the Divine Mother is is God incarnate, and through her, we see God. We see we see aspects of God that are better manifested through um, the feminine ideal, the feminine avatar. And then Ramakrishna, you know, and Vivekananda bring us uh, the manifestation through the male uh, characteristics. And uh, I think everybody can see, you know, that a mom and a dad are two aspects of the one divine. And so we, we get that very clearly here in the presence of Holy Mother. So tonight we're going to look at Holy Mother in Jairambati. We're on page 183 in this book. And uh, Holy Mother in Jairambati. Holy Mother left Balaram's home in October 1894, Jairambati, where she lived until July of 1893. She was fond of Jairambati because she could move about freely among her neighbors without wearing a veil. In Calcutta, she wore a veil most of the time when she was with male devotees and disciples of the master. She lived like a caged bird in the houses of her devotees, where she followed all the formalities and always had to be mindful of what she did and said. She did not have much freedom. You know, I, I, this is a, a part of Indian culture that I don't think many Westerners really ever get a taste of. Um, uh, and I, it's taken me a long time uh, in my friendships with some of the devotees and some of the women devotees to actually get straightforward stories about what it's like for them in India. And, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking in particular of, of a friend of mine who's very accomplished, a, a research scientist, you know, a homeowner in the United States, uh, well, well decorated education wise. And there's just no appreciation for her accomplishments at all with her family. Her family's notion is that she overeducated herself and now she's no good as a wife to a husband. And so they have, they, they, they're not proud of her. They don't honor her for her accomplishments. Uh, they berate her for her independence and for, you know, uh, her getting an education and and uh, owning a home and all of those things. And when she goes home, she's not allowed to go out of the house when she wants to. She has to have somebody accompany her every time she leaves the home. And she's not allowed to wear what she wants when she goes out of the home. Her mother has to approve what she wears, uh, you know, and, and all of these things. And uh, she says that when she violates those, people feel in her hometown feel like they have the right to, to berate her on the street in public uh, for not obeying the rules. And so, you know, here in the States, we don't have anything near this anymore. It, it used to be not quite to that extent, I don't think, but in the olden days, certainly, uh, there was a lot more of that idea. But uh, we see here, Holy Mother has to deal with the same restrictions simply for being a woman. Uh, it's it's mind-boggling to somebody coming from the West to see the difference in the way that men are treated and women are treated uh, when you travel in India. It's it's phenomenal what the Indian woman uh, deals with. Uh, it's 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 astounding to me actually uh, what they how the to grow up in that kind of structured, outrageously structured environment. That doesn't leave you any personal options. Uh, you know, the, the raises you, you will be this way and your goal is marriage. And uh, and then, you know, if you think that getting out of the family and getting married is going to make you free, <laughs> you can know that you have just been uh, bonded to servanthood for the rest of your life to your husband. And they mean it. <laughs> they, they really mean it. And that's the ideal. And so we just see 
uh, Holy Mother um, submitting to that and not just submitting to it, but really making the best life of it. And there's a very unpopular, but, but very important lesson that we can learn from this. You know, why did Holy Mother not uh, stand up against all of these traditions and, you know, stand up for this and that and the other? And the reason is kind of hard to swallow, I think, but the one that I've, because I've done a lot of wrestling with it, why, 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 why? Uh, and, and really at the end of the day, for spiritual life, it doesn't matter. Spiritual life is not a matter of condition and circumstance, right? Now, Holy Mother did, uh, did stand up for things that were spiritually right, like the fact that she did not consider, because Takor was visiting her even after death, uh, you know, that she had married a holy man. And so she wore a red bordered sari. She refused to, to wear the widow's garb. She refused to shave her head. She refused to stop wearing her bangles. And so on, uh, in the spiritual light and the spiritual realm, mother was absolutely free and absolutely full of bliss and, and inner, inner joy uh, because her life was not about uh, the externals, wasn't about the circumstances and conditions that she was born into. And so she obeyed them. And we see the same thing in Takur also. You know, Takur was very concerned about doing things in the proper way and paying respects to things. When they, vided, in, when they violated a spiritual principle, uh, Takor would absolutely not, not tolerate them at all, you know? And so it's really, for Takor Ma, what was the most important thing? What is that one most important thing? Uh, and we see that the way that he employed, uh, uh, you know, Sister Nivedita and had her start a school and uh, teach the young girls and to try and uh, do education. And we see by the work of the order with the uplift of women in India, you know, training women to be teachers and, and uh, allowing them into the university and whatnot, that uh, in effort, uh, the order views, views women in that way and, and, and is very pro, <laughs> pro woman, I guess. Uh, but but seeking to reform in a non-confrontational, uh, a non-disrespectful uh, way, but kind of you know slowly just keeping a steady pressure in the right direction uh, that that we all um, you know can work together. So I know that's a that's a tough teaching, and I certainly would be offended by much of the way that women are treated. But that's not ours to be offended by. You know that's. Uh, we can share our thoughts, we can have our ideas, and we can push for our changes if, if we find that to be the important thing. But we must remember, first and foremost, we're spiritual, we're spiritual seekers, and that we're not men and we're not women, and that's the ideal. <laughs> and, in, and, and in our efforts in the world, our ideal is to not see each other by gender, but to see each other as divine. And so this, this is the work that we do. And this is, this is what we focus on and how we approach the world. And if we're successful in that, the reform will happen of itself without picking that reform in particular in order to influence it or make it happen. And so I think that's the general idea or general principle around those situations. And I only say that because I know as Westerners, it's quite easy for us to get a, into a clutch our pearl situation like, oh my glory. <laughs> how can that be like that how can those people do that uh you know because uh that's the one thing that we that we are proud of our of our accomplishments and so we think everybody else should do it that way also um, but this is the dog's curly tail we may we may do well in that regard but nobody exploits a woman like the united states <laughs> you know at every turn uh women are exploited for their bodies and for their sexuality uh, and and you won't find that in India, you know. There there's there's definitely a more modest approach to it. Now they've got other issues around that. So this is going to turn into a us and them conversation, which is exactly what I was trying to avoid, <laughs> because that's not the way it is. There is no us or them. It's us and the divine. Uh, but I wanted to frame it that way so that we don't get too caught up into the into these 
ideals. They are taking care of themselves and by being spiritual, will have the right attitude and reforms will happen of their own accord. But here's mother, you know, like a caged bird in the houses of her devotees where she followed all the formalities and always had to be mindful of what she did and said, and she did not have much freedom. In Jairambati, where she was born and brought up, she felt relaxed. When she was in Calcutta, she always pined for the rural environment, for the fresh air, the vast meadows, and the open-hearted conversations with her neighbors that she enjoyed in the village. And definitely, I mean, anybody who's been to India will know exactly what she's talking about. Uh, you know, the, the cities are very oppressive, you know, very dirty, very, very polluted, just very difficult to get around, very congested, chaos and noise 24-7 in every direction. But you get out to Jairambati, oh my goodness gracious. First of all, the people, the people that live in village India are the most beautiful in general, big generalizations, but I just found them to be the most open, guileless, sweethearted people in the world. Just marvelous. And out there, uh, you know, life goes on in the same way that it's been going on for thousands of years. Uh, just very simple, uh, you know, um, very orderly, uh, and uh, uh, and just wide open space. You know, Jairambati is surrounded by rice paddies all around, and those the verdant green of a rice paddy is amazing. And so it's quite beautiful. So I understand, and and any of you can go stay there. You know, you can go sit on Holy Mother's porch where she sat, where we have pictures of her sitting. You can go sit there and you can meditate in Mother's home, you know, <laughs> and, and really uh, you can go see where, where, where she bathed and you can go see where she walked. And it's an amazing experience to go see this beautiful place. So she's back and she can be herself. She can be free, not not having to follow all of these strict rules that that are that were part of the city life at that point. We have no detailed information of her life during this period, but we know that she must have helped her mother with housework and served the devotees. A new chapter began in Holy Mother's life. She was no longer Sharada, the shy and timid village girl. She started to assume her role as Jagadamba, the mother of the universe. We see that in her practice, you know, Holy Mother, I mean, uh, Ramakrishna told her, you know, that uh, when when he felt that she was longing for having children and he told her, he says, oh, don't think like that. I will give you more children soon. So many people will be calling you mother that you'll be running for the hills <laughs> because that was her practice and that was her reality. She is, in fact, the mother of the universe. And her practice in her life was to treat every one of us as her son or daughter. And, uh, you know, that relationship is so refreshing for us to see God as divine mother and to see that heart of compassion, that heart of patience uh, that, that is unique uh, to, to mothers, to motherhood, to, to the feminine divine. And uh, so we see her carrying out that practice with a lot of authority and a lot of power. You know, the order in the early days, uh, the early they they uh, went to Holy Mother for permission to do everything. And Ramakrishna says nobody gets realization until Holy until the Divine Mother uh, allows them. So Mother, the Divine Mother, is the is the the keeper of your realization. So she started to assume her role as Jagadamba, the mother of the universe. Her speech and demeanor changed. Her motherly love and compassion, her patience and forbearance awakened to a greater extent. She had resolved to fulfill her mission to demonstrate the motherhood of God. At that time, it was not easy to reach Jairambati, but the devotees from far and near gradually began to visit Holy Mother there to receive her grace and her spiritual instruction. She lived in a small mud hut that belonged to her brother, Prasanna Kumar, and her visitors stayed in another mud hut, which was used as the parlor. 
Holy Mother's cottage had been preserved by the Ramakrishna order. Yes, yeah, so you can go and see it. You can go and see it. I remember they were cleaning it out the day that I was sitting in there meditating. And when they were going to empty the dustpan, <laughs> I said, no, 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 don't throw that away. And I had them empty the dustpan into a little baggie. And I brought back the dust from Holy Mother's floor in her home and had that for years, actually. I don't, I don't have it anymore. One of my moves, I divested myself of all those things. In 1877, 1877, Shyama Shandari had started to worship Mother Jagadatri every year, and Holy Mother tried to be present for the worship. Dur during Jagadatri Pudra on the 10th of November, 1891, Swami Shadar Dananda, Mohan, Mitra, Vaikuntha Nat Sanyal, Kali Krishna, later Swami Virajananda, Yogan Ma and Golok Ma went to Jairambati. Virajananda left a wonderful account of Holy Mother's life there. How happy the mother felt at our arrival. She seemed to be utterly at a loss as to how she could make us comfortable. All that she did ceaselessly for our entertainment from dawn to night did not appear to her to be sufficient. She herself cooked both morning and evening. What a variety of dishes and how delicious they were. There was something ethereal about that taste. She would be sitting close by as we took our meals and insisted that we must eat more. Sometimes she would prepare some curry that Sri Ramakrishna liked. You know, this, <laughs> this is one of my favorite experiences there. Uh, actually, when I was at, Ch in, in, at Chardamat, when I had visited um, and taken initiation from Moksha Prana there, and after the initiation, you know, I was invited downstairs for some food in the kitchen. So I went down, they sat me at this little table, and I don't know, there were five or six nuns. And oh my Lord, they filled that table with a variety of dishes and were just, they each wanted me to taste one. And if I, if I liked something, oh, they just would get so excited and, and go and bring me huge amounts more. And I was just, that was, I really was changed by that one experience because I had just taken initiation. So I had that whole idea. And then to go and be so sweetly served by these women who so earnestly considered me their son. And just like what is being reported here about mother, that, that they, it just seemed like they could never do enough for you. They just, they were always wanting just your joy, your inspiration, your happiness was was everything to them and uh I, I had never been treated like that i had never felt like that in my life until i had that experience that day and it's still like that if you go to jairambati or if you go to to uh, uh the mother's house in calcutta uh anywhere to one of to mother's places food is so primary and always made with such care uh, and 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 just served so freely it's a wonderful experience i hope everybody can have it at some point for sure so four of us sharadananda haramohan vaikuntha and virajananda were accommodated in the small room in the outer apartment of the house just by the side of it, there was an open hall where Jagadatri Pudra was to be held. The back door of our room opened to the inner courtyard. At its other end was the thatched cottage of mother. Sometimes when the door was kept open, I could see her on the veranda of her cottage, dressing vegetables or doing some household work. I saw mother cleaning the dishes in the small pond and carrying cooking and drinking water in a pitcher from the Talpukor. Banerjee's pond, on her waist like the other village women. I had voluntarily taken up the task of plucking flowers and bell leaves for the worship from the interior of the village and from the bushes and trees on the river. As I was very young, the mother did not maintain her usual bashfulness in my presence. Hence, it, may, it became my duty to run errands for Shara Maharaj, Sharadananda, and the elderly devotees, in that connection, I had to go to the inner apartments to bring this and that. This was for me a great blessing, since I got the opportunity to see the Holy Mother several times a day. You know, this this serving of holy people 
is uh, it's very foreign to us as Westerners also. And I'm speaking from my own experience on that. Uh, uh, I didn't always, or I had to fight quite often to maintain this attitude that Holy Mother is having here about, uh, you know, just taking great delight in, in, in serving holy people. You know, there were times when I would get, you know, frustrated, be like, why, why can't he wash his own bathroom? <laughs> you know, <laughs> why do I have to, you know, do all the cooking uh, in a very American kind of way? And I, and I feel like even to this day, I feel like I really missed a very important aspect of real Vedanta, real uh, monastic life by not having quite ever really gotten into that uh, flow of, of service of, of the, you know, my seniors of the holy men. And, uh, you know, so, so when we, when we do our work for the temple, you know, when we, when we do our volunteers things to the temple, see it from this perspective that this is a, you, you are in a very direct way serving the beloved, your beloved. And to keep that in mind and to, to just be happy, to be able to have the privilege, the opportunity to serve. Uh, we don't often treat service as an opportunity or as a privilege in the West. And yet it is uh, because it is something that, that helps us uh, grow spiritually and break down our karma and actually find a certain amount of inner joy that comes through that service, through that loving. Not to mention, it's a great way to get to spend time with your guru and with these great souls to get just to get to see how they live and what their life is like from the day to day, because it is different. They're very different in the way they treat each other, uh, things they talk about, um, things that they do. We used to call Holy Mother's mother Didi Ma or grandmother. She was a very simple, very sweet natured woman. She always kept herself busy with the many duties of her household, such as looking after the cattle, cleaning the cow shed, feeding the laborers in the field, husking rice and so on. Yet one never missed the graceful smile on her face. She would tell us many stories of Sri Ramakrishna's youth, how he would sing and make women laugh with jokes and frivolous stories. When we, were called, when we called her Didima, that elderly woman was beside herself with joy. See, don't, don't brush over that too easy, too quickly there. Look at how hard she was working. You know, having to husk the rice, take care of the cattle, clean the cow shed. Any one of those jobs is huge. And yet she would carry them on and always be found with this charming, wonderful smile. And, and uh, you know, making time to share these wonderful stories about Ramakrishna in his youth. And, uh, you know, just just this way of living. It's, it's what we were talking about earlier, Regino, you know, at the beginning, when we were bef before class started, this notion of acceptance, this notion of, of, of accepting everything as the divine will, as everything being perfect as it is, and having that attitude as we approach things. So that when we're working super hard and somebody comes and gives us another dirty plate to wash, uh, we don't have a conniption, you know, because <laughs> I just finished washing all the dishes. Why didn't you get that in here earlier? You know, that that's not the spirit with which these things are done amongst devotees, amongst, amongst uh, you know, people, seekers of the divine. Uh, service and work. These are our opportunity. These are our karma yoga. We burn out our, our poor karmas and we replace them with, 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 uh, with love. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Not more karmas because we don't want any karmas, good or bad. We just want, we want no, no sense of self as a, as, a, as a smallness here at all. We want everything to be a response from our nature. You know, and this is what, what service is a practice for. It's, it's, it's letting us work away the ego because it's only the ego that has a problem with service. It's only the ego that, that doesn't like to see itself less than others. It's only the ego that keeps track of what I've done for you and what have you done for me. Uh, and so service is a practice in order to, to break down that, that horrid way of thinking, 
where we're constantly metering out our love and checking it accordingly to the love that others have for us. So we've turned our love into shopkeeping, into a mercantile exchange. And so uh, you having the opportunity to serve and to give to holy people is, is a way of undoing that wrong learning, a way of undoing that trap that we've been caught in. So that when we serve, we can also be said we were beside ourselves in joy. <laughs> Got a long way to go on that. Oof. All right. One day, a ball, Haridas Vairagi of Deshra was his name, apparently, came to the door of the house and asked for alms. So he's begging. He was singing a song relating to Parvati, the consort of Shiva, to the accompaniment of a violin. O Uma, my darling. His song goes, what good tidings I hear. People say you are adored in Varanasi as Annapurna. Is it true? O oh, Gauri, when I married you to Shiva, he was a beggar from door to door for a morsel of food. But today, how glad I am to hear you are now queen of the world, seated by his side. And they called my naked Shiva a madman. How much abuse I had to bear from everyone. Now I hear that doorkeepers guard his palace and gods like Indra, Chandra, and Yama can hardly see him. Shiva used to live in the Himalayas. Many a day he got his food by begging. Now he rules over Varanasi and is as rich as Kubera. Is it you who have brought him all this good fortune? No doubt he is very rich now. Else why should Gauri be so proud? She does not cast her eyes even upon her own children and turns her face from Radhika. Radhika was the composer of that song. So imagine, okay, this song, are you seeing, are you seeing the magic that's happening here? You have Holy Mother, who is, you know, Ramakrishna has, has left the body. She's coming into her own as the Divine Mother. And this man comes to the door and is singing this song that could be a song about her life. You know, that she went through all of this, that her husband was a begging uh, wanderer, that people called him to be insane, and that she was married to him and went through a very humiliating period where, where people made fun of her for, for her husband, you know, her ash-strewn husband who was constantly flipping out in ecstasy. You know, and how and how much abuse she had to bear from everyone because they called my naked Shiva a madman. And so I'm sure that she was aware of this, but can you imagine the impact on her when this begging uh, singer of, of the divine songs comes begging for alms and sings this song to her and she's seeing her life story in this song about Shiva and his wife Parvati. It's, it, the power of, of that, the inspiration of that must have been really quite something because at just at that time, she's poised on the doorstep of her ministry, of her life-changing ministry to the world, presenting to us God as mother. Just amazing. And that, and then, and then even saying, "Is it you that has brought Shiva this much, this much uh, wealth and and wonder?" You know, like giving her credit uh, for for the work, for the success of the work of Tapur in this case, quite lovely and really profound, actually. The song cast a spell on all of us who listened. Emotions rose high. Yogin Ma and Golup Ma asked him to sing that song again, and they gave him some money. Didn't the words bring a true picture of our own Holy Mother? Didi Ma said, well, in those days, people called my son-in-law a lunatic. They expressed their grief at Sharada's lot. How many abusers they hur abuses they hurled at me, too. There was no end to my silent agony, but today... See how many men and women are respect of respectable families are looking upon Sharada as a goddess and worshipping at her feet. During our stay at Jairambati, we visited Karmapakur a number of times. 
While returning to Jairambati, we would bring chilibis and other sweets for mother from Karmapakur. Most of it, however, would be given to us during our refreshments, along with puffed rice mixed with ghee. The Jagadatri Puja was performed with great eclat. The image of Mother Jagadatri was beautiful. One felt that she really had come in the flesh and blood to accept the offerings of her children. Holy Mother herself would be seen standing near the place of worship with folded hands during arati, and sometimes fanning the goddess with a shamra. All the days she was intensely occupied with other women in arrangements for the puja and for cooking. The worship continued for three days, and many hundreds were sumptuously fed every day. There was a yatra, a theatrical performance, on two nights, and many people of adjoining villages came to see the performance. After three days of worship, the immersion ceremony was a moving sight. Holy Mother and the other women burst into tears. You know, that's one of those beautiful notions. I mean, that 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 Pudra, you know, was see, the, seeing God as mother coming to your house, you know, and inhabiting the image. And in that worship, the first part of that worship is inviting the Divine Mother to inhabit the image in front of you so that you can worship her as separate from yourself, so that you can offer her flowers and incense and saris and fans and combs and oil and all those things that get offered during that puja. And then, you know, at the end, which when the, when, when the statue gets tossed out into the sea, what's really happening is mother's being invited to come back into the heart to, to, to inhabit the shrine of your temple, your body. And that's where we find her. When we do our practice, we find the divine mother there. But this idea that, that, you know, what has mistakenly been called idolatry, in India is not idolatry because you ask God to inhabit that image. That image isn't by default God. That image has to be inhabited by God. And then God is worshipped through proxy, through that image. But then God returns, you know. And so it's it's a wonderful uh, practice and a real way of, of engaging yourself, uh, your, your body, actions, mind, and words all together. Uh, when you do a worship, you know, when you on the shrine. So it's a beautiful, beautiful. And so this has been going on. And so after it's, after it's all done, when they were taking the immersion and returning the statue, everybody's weeping, you know, at the, at the idea of mother going back to the heart in a strange way and no longer being with them as a guest in the house as such. Days passed in supreme happiness. A couple of days after the puja, all four of us were suddenly attacked by malaria. In that small room, we lay in adjoining beds, shivering with high temperatures. Holy Mother's worries knew no bounds. She would stand at the threshold of the door and look at us with love and compassion. One could hear her exclaim, Oh, what a pity. My sons are suffering so much. What a wretched, out-of-the-way village this is. It is hard to get any milk to prepare the sago. With a bowl in hand, Holy Mother would go to the villagers who had cows for a little milk. In those villages, the farmers paid more attention to the bullocks that cultivated the land and fed them more. The milk cows were neglected, so the output of milk was quite scanty. After collecting one or two cups of milk, Holy Mother would prepare our diet. However, we recovered after a few days and took our normal food. Because of our long stay in Jairamati might cause additional physical strain on the mother, we decided to return to Calcutta. Although she insisted that we stay longer, we somehow convinced her that we should return to Calcutta. The bullet carts were ready after lunch and we boarded them. Didi Ma and the neighbors were present and Holy Mother was standing in front of the back door of the house silently watching the scene from a distance. Her face was puffy and reddish from the tears that rolled down from her eyes. The carts moved on. Mother was following us. Repeatedly, we implored her, return, but she wouldn't listen. At last, the carts passed by the Talpukar, the southern border of the village, and entered the extensive meadow outside. 
As long as I could see could see from inside the cart, I watched Mother standing by the side of the pond <laughs> with her eyes fixed on us. Just such a love. <laughs> A mother's love, you know, and this is why God would come as a mother. Uh, there, there is nothing like the love between a mother and and her children, you know, in a healthy situation. Just that that heart, you know, just beautiful. All right, a new section here. Holy Mother blesses Vivekananda. While in Madras, in southern India, in March and April of 1893, Vivekananda had a significant dream. He saw Ramakrishna walking into the ocean and beckoning him to follow. He also heard the command, go. Although Swamiji was now certain of his journey to the west, he still felt it necessary to seek the Holy Mother's permission. He wrote to Swami Shadananda, I've had a vision in which the master told me to go to the West. My mind is quite disturbed. Please tell Holy Mother everything and let me know her opinion. Sharanananda went to the Holy Mother and read Swamiji's letter to her. Holy Mother did not respond immediately, but asked Sharanananda to wait. After a couple of days, Holy Mother had a similar dream. She saw Ramakrishna walking over the ocean waves and asking Narendra to follow him. Then Holy Mother told Shadarananda, please write to Naran that he should go to the West. Swamiji was overjoyed when he received Holy Mother's approval. In his reminiscences of Swamiji, Kiran Chandradatta included this story that Swami Turiyananda had shared with him. Swami was then, Swamiji was then in Madras and his devotees were arranging to send him to America. In a vision, Swamiji saw the master motioning to him to go to the West, but he decided to get permission from Holy Mother before making his final decision. He did not know whether the mother was in Jairambati or Calcutta at that time, so he wrote to Sharat Maharaj in Alambazar, at the Alambazar Mat, to forward his letter to Holy Mother. Sharad Maharaj forwarded the letter to Holy Mother, who was then in Jairambati. A few days later, Holy Mother said to her brother Kali, Today Naran's letter will come. You go and pick it up from the mailman. Kali replied, Today is not a mail delivery day. At that time, the mail was delivered once or twice a week, and the mailman would stop, would wait at a particular place to give someone the letters to Jairambati. The post office was in Anur, three or four miles away. As Holy Mother insisted, Kali went to the local mail station and found that the mailman was waiting with a single letter, which was addressed to Holy Mother. Urgent was written on the envelope. Amazed, he took the letter and returned to Jairambati. He told the mother, Sister, you have a letter. She was cutting vegetables just then. She asked Kali, open the letter, read it to me. After listening to the letter, she said, bring some paper and a pen and write to Naran. Certainly you should go to the West. This is the master's work. This will do good to humanity. Shyama Sundari was sitting nearby repeating a mantra. She had heard everything and said, Sharu, where are you sending Naran? That country is beyond seven oceans and 13 rivers. Holy Mother replied, last night, the master appeared to me and said, Tomorrow, Naran's letter will come. This is the work of the Divine Mother. It will do good to humanity. Give him your permission to go. It seems Holy Mother's letter to Swamiji was mailed to Sharat Maharaj in Alambazar Mat, and he sent it to Swamiji in Madras. So you see Holy, how important Holy Mother's opinion was to Vivekananda. And for obvious reasons, <laughs> she was in touch with Ramakrishna. And so she got a direct a direct blessing, even though it was breaking that taboo, you know, just like, uh, just like she was reminded of here at the end. You know, it is beyond the seven oceans and the 13 rivers. This is forbidden. What are you telling him to do? And so you see when mother, when mother in spiritual matters, 
nothing else mattered. Do what is right. Do what do what is needed. Forget forget rules. <laughs> forget injunctions when it comes to these things, you know, in your spiritual life. <laughs> and so he goes. Marvelous. Holy Mother returns to Belur. Holy Mother returned to Calcutta in July of 1893. She stayed with Balaram's family for a few days, and then her devotees rented Nalambar Mukherjee's garden house at Belur for her, the same house where she had stayed in 1888. Holy Mother moved there with Yogan Ma, Golab Ma, and Swami Trukunatitananda, who became her attendant and ran errands. It was a very quiet place, and Mother spent most of her time there in worship, japa, and meditation. Wow. Let me see. That's what Mother does with her extra time. <laughs> she doesn't even have extra time, I'm sure, with all that service and all the devotees coming for a constant stream of advice and to visit her. But spending all of our time, it would be a nice thing to keep to keep this in the forefront of our mind, though. It's only something I've just started working on. <laughs> it's, it's always embarrassing to say things like that. But, you know, to, to take your free time and to use it for your japam, your puja, your meditation, you know, your worship, to always keep that going. That's where you put your extra time. Because this is the one most important thing, right? This loving, learning to love, love God, and love God in all beings. It is wonderful how the disciples of the Master sincerely and joyfully served Holy Mother. For example, Swami Trugunatitananda would pick up fl would pick flowers for Holy Mother to use in her morning worship. In the evening, he would spread a white cloth under the shephalalika, a fragrant white flower so that its blooms would not fall into the dirt. It was probably in July or August of 1893 that Holy Mother performed the Panchatapa, or that austerity of five fires on the roof of Nalambar's house. This severe austerity is observed by sitting for Japam and meditating from dawn till dusk. So this, this worship that she did, she sat on the roof, she started four fires at the four corners and she sat in the middle under the sun, which is the fifth fire. And uh, there's no refreshment. And if you've been to Calcutta in the summer, <laughs> you know that that's, that sun being the fifth fire is no joke. And so she sat there with these four burning fires uh, and the sun doing japam from dawn until dusk. She did not move, did not drink, did not eat. So that's why it's called quite an austerity to do. This severe austerity is observed by sitting for japam and meditation from dawn to dusk, surrounded by four fires and the blazing sun above. It may be remember, remembered that when Holy Mother went to Varanasi after Ramakrishna passed away, her mind was grief-stricken. A woman ascetic of Nepal who was an adept in various kinds of sadhana, advised Holy Mother to perform the Panchatapa to calm her mind. Holy Mother had also a couple of visions in Karmaprakor regarding the Panchatapa ceremony. Accordingly, Holy Mother decided to perform it. And this is the, the rooftop where she did it. And this is the view off of the roof, the, the river right there. And uh, I've been up there. <laughs> And you can too. <laughs> if you ever go to Bellarmont, it's right there, right at right at the Bellarmont campus on the on the. I don't know if it's north, south, east, or west, but it's to the right. <laughs> and you can go there. You can see the rooms. We see where she stayed, and you can go and you can sit there, and uh, uh, you know, and just enjoy the devotion that comes up from actually seeing that these things are real, that these things happen.
A thick layer of earth was laid on the roof of Nalambar's house, and the four blazing fires of dried cow dung cakes were lighted in a square, seven and a half feet apart from each other. Holy Mother recalled, Sometime after the master's passing away, I often had a vision of a bearded sannyasin who asked me to perform the Panchatapa ceremony. In the beginning, I didn't pay any heed to it, and moreover, I was unaware that what the Panchatapa was. But when the sannyasin insisted, I asked Yoganma about it. She said, well, mother, I shall perform it with you. Arrangements were made for the Panchatapa ceremony at the Nilambar Babu's house in Belur. Blazing fires of drought, dried cow dung were lighted on the four sides, and the scorching sun was overhead. After a morning bath in the Ganges, I approached the fire and found the flames up. I was seized with a great fear, and I wondered how could I enter that main area and remain seated there until sunset. After repeating the master's name, I entered the area surrounded by fire. It felt as if they had lost their heat. Thus, I practiced this, dis this discipline for seven days. I totally don't remember that. That's unbelievable. For seven days, she did this. Wow. As a result, my fair complexion became like black ashes. After that, I never saw the sannyasin anymore. So, oh my God, that's amazing. So seven days, dusk, from dawn till dusk, sitting amongst the fires, uh, you know, with no refreshment, doing this practice continually. But you see the faith that she had because she was stricken by, by fear, you know, these big fires going up. Seven and, a, seven and a half feet apart is not so far, you know, <laughs> and there are big fires. And she was afraid, but what was the cure to her fear? She took the name of God. She started repeating Takor's name, you know, and she said in that the fire lost its heat. And so she walked into the middle of the fires and sat down and just continued her japam, her surrender, just letting go, letting go for seven days until her complexion had become dark dark like black ash she said from the sun holy mother related another vision regarding the panchatapa practice while i was in karmapakur i saw with my physical eyes a girl about 11 or 12 years old like radu she wore an ochre cloth and rudraksha beads so like a wandering saint around her neck, and her hair was dry and shaggy. She accompanied me wherever I went. After I performed the Panchatapa ceremony at Nilambar Babu's house in Belur, that girl disappeared. I never saw her again. The external fire of the Panchatapa relieved the burning anguish within that Holy Mother, that Holy Mother had felt since the Master's passing, and she felt an inner peace. Years later, when a devotee asked her about the Panchatapa, she said, yes, it was necessary. Parvati, the Divine Mother, practiced the austerity to obtain Shiva as her husband. Then she added, I performed this austerity to set an example for others. Otherwise, people would say, what is extraordinary about her? She eats and sleeps and moves about like an ordinary person. When an intimate disciple wanted to know the real reason that she went through the ordeal, she said, My child, I went through it for the sake of all of you. Can you practice austerities? This is why I had to do it. So even in that, it was a service to us, you know, to, to help break our karma. And so when we pray to her and meditate on her and call her name, we get that same relief. You know, this, all, all the avatars when they have come, have come for that reason, you know, to give us grace, to help us reach the beloved. And so consistently, uh, that grace, that forgiveness is reached through the avatar, that one, the word that has come many, many, many times uh, to extend a hand 
to show love, to teach us about a love that doesn't exist in this world, an unconditioned love, love with no requirement. Amazing. 